Before this is over, I will be making some fanboys mad. And I'm gonna start with a shot at Big Daddy Red. You could argue that Nintendo is the most important console maker of all time. Originally a trading card and toy company, they found some initial success in gaming in the midway space, but it was the one million units of their first home console, the Color TV series, that locked in their destiny. Too bad the thing's a D. And look, I'm sorry, but first generation consoles really don't hold up. And while our ranking system will account for the lower expectations that gamers would have had at the time, kind of an uh, opinions adjusted for inflation, if you will, at the end of the day, a major consideration has to be, historical importance aside, how fun are the games today? And the good news is that when we reach Nintendo's third generation offering, the answer becomes very, in large part thanks to the inclusion of hardware scrolling backgrounds. And look, I know that doesn't sound like a huge deal, but this is what platforming looks like on the competition. Start on the left, jump over obstacle, reach the right side of the screen, rinse and repeat. Woohoo. Meanwhile on the NES, look at him go! Woohoo! And upgraded cartridges would push its capabilities even further, changing video games forever. The Famicom, or family computer as it was known in Japan, quickly took the crown for the best selling console in history. And thanks to Nintendo's savvy third party publishing negotiations, living room friendly branding, and focus on content quality, they would continue that success in the challenging North American market. In our minds, the NES marks the end of console gaming's infancy and the beginning of its childhood years. It was the start of huge franchises like Final Fantasy, The Legend of Zelda, Metroid, Mario, and more. And it was also affordable. It's an A. And the only reason is that as innovative as they were, most of its best games are essentially obsolete. Every franchise that I just mentioned got a bigger sequel on Nintendo's very next console that was better in almost every way. And we're gonna get to that after this quick message from our sponsor. Ridge, hey, is that a boring old bifold wallet in your pocket or are you just happy to see the alternative, Ridge's sleek and high quality wallets? Well, in any case, go to the link below and use code Linus to save 10% off your purchase and get free shipping. <laughs> The Super Nintendo Entertainment System didn't change the formula much, but its more refined technology gave developers a platform to focus on what's most important, making great games. And this was clear right out of the gate with F-Zero, a flashy look at the future using the 3D power of Mode 7, and Super Mario World, which is still the best 2D Mario game. And the hits just kept coming with a library of games that ranges from still playable to contenders for best ever in the RPG and 2D platforming genres. There were some turds too, of course, but Super Nintendo is our first S tier. And uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, Nintendo's last for a while. With competition ramping up on all sides and pirate flags flying high, Nintendo doubled down on their walled garden philosophy, leading to the big error that, along with several others, would tank this generation for them, choosing proprietary cartridges over CDs. I get it. Nintendo's lucrative licensing agreements were easier to control when they ran the production line, but cartridges cost many times as much and hold only a fraction of the amount of data. This resulted in developers making serious compromises to run on Nintendo's 64-bit machine, which is a shame because the raw performance of the N64 was actually at the top of its generation. It just wouldn't be fully unlocked until decades later by community modders. Sometimes limitations breed creativity though, and the N64 ended up with a very strong library, at least if you focus on its goats. Ocarina of Time and Mario 64 still come up in those conversations, and most first party titles on the system are, or at least were, outstanding, even if Yoshi got done kinda dirty. The problem is that the good third party games for the console were rare, get it? And we'd need to see a deeper library for a higher placement. It's gonna be a B. The good news is that Nintendo learned. For the GameCube, they worked on their relationships, ensuring that it was easy to develop for, and they even chose optical media, albeit 
at a silly smaller size. So the old purple lunchbox would end up with a more complete library with some entries in long running franchise even considered their best, like Smash Melee, Metroid Prime, and Resident Evil 4. Okay, the controller sucked Donkey Kong for pretty much any game that wasn't specifically designed for it, but at least it wasn't as alien or flaccid as its older sibling. B. It's a B. It's just too bad that nobody cared at the time, leading Nintendo to a major shift in strategy that persists today. To avoid competing head to head with Microsoft and Sony's HD systems, Nintendo basically repackaged the cube into an overclocked rectangle with some extra RAM and launched it alongside a motion controller that, by the way, also was originally designed for the GameCube. At the time, the Wii felt a little bit disappointing considering its revolution codename. But if you felt that way, you were probably a real gamer because for everyone else, it was something else. It was fun. It would be easy to dismiss the console based on the mountain of wiggle waggle shovelware that was published for it. But it was Nintendo's first backwards compatible home system and its early lead in sales incentivized third party developers to put in the work to build out its library, even if the ports weren't the best ones available. Now, sadly for emulation and eShop enthusiasts, many of its most interesting titles are trapped there because of the novel control scheme, but we are still putting the Wii on the A tier for all the retirement homes that are still bowling and golfing. Unfortunately, like the people in those homes, the Wii's gimmicks did get kind of old and its successor was probably Nintendo's lowest point. It had more power than the aging seventh gen hardware that Nintendo launched it against, but it also had confusing branding and a quasi portable controller screen gimmick that most games completely failed to take advantage of. Not helping matters, new first party games were slow to show up due to a focus on HD remasters, which led to slow sales, which led to poor third party support again. It did get some unironically great games, including kicking off Mario Kart 8's decade of Nintendo refusing to give us another Mario Kart. But today, there are fewer and fewer reasons to leave an unmodded Wii U plugged in, other than its ability to output older Wii games via HDMI. We're gonna give it a C. Luckily, the Switch immediately switched up the conversation, delivering on the hybrid handheld promises of the Wii U and putting Nintendo back on top. It launched with what is arguably the best game from one of the strongest gaming franchises ever and has followed it up with banger after banger after banger. The enormous install base has prompted developers to move heaven and earth to shrink their games to work on it, resulting in sometimes a pretty good experience, especially if you consider that the console is little more than an Nvidia Shield tablet with custom firmware and controllers. It is underpowered compared to the machines of today and even the machines of its time, but it is a great way to pack Mario and the gang into the screen safe slot of your LTT backpack, lttstore.com. We are giving the Switch our second S for revitalizing the handheld gaming market. As for the future, it remains to be seen whether Nintendo can retain the Switch's momentum against the rise of PC handhelds and the rumors of Sony's return, not to mention Microsoft's entry, but I'm hopeful. Surely the good, bad, good, bad pattern can't continue. Speaking of things that couldn't continue, Sega. And oh boy, do they ever have weirder origins than I realized. The Japanese giant was founded by Americans? who sold slot machines to US army bases, which is why they were at one point called Sir Irvis Ge Ims. Weird foreshadowing by the way, but okay. Sega's first home console, like Nintendo's, was designed to play stripped down arcade ports and the SG-1000 was in that sense better than the color TV with interchangeable cartridges and a fair bit more power, which is neat, but the MK3, or as you might know it in the West, the Master System is where Sega's sales went parabolic. We are giving the SG-1000 a D, which won't surprise anyone, and we're giving the Master System a C, which will surprise folks in the regions where it would go on to have an exceptionally long life with some kind of impressive peripherals. 
Everywhere else, though, it suffered from its focus on arcade-style games and Sega's notoriously bad habit of supplanting their systems a little too quickly. Just three years after the Master System, Sega launched the Mega Drive, or Genesis for us Yankerdoodles, powered by the Motorola 68000, a familiar 16-bit chip that powered countless other arcade games and home computers. Sega brought blast processing to the party, which is a real thing, we think. No one is 100% sure what it was, but most likely it referred to DMA, or the ability to directly drive a CRT through brute force, regardless of the VDP's palette limitations. It also had a more powerful CPU than the Super Nintendo, which arrived two whole years later, and, thanks to some clever design choices, it even had backwards compatibility with Master System games. Not that it needed it. The Genesis has a phenomenal library that is undeniably Sega's best. Even beyond the blue blur, there's a huge variety of games designed to appeal to a slightly more mature audience, thanks to Sega's looser third-party ecosystem, and many Genesis games just straight up play better than their SNES competition, even if they usually look a little worse. I wanted so badly to put it in the S tier, but before we can rank it, we need to talk about some of the truly baffling moves that Sega made late on in its life cycle. First, they launched a CD add-on. That was actually a mild success, allowing its aging 80s hardware to push past the newer SNES in some key ways, like improved sprite scaling, as well as CD quality audio, and the ability to play interactive FMV video games, if you're into those. But then, as this sort of next-gen stopgap, Sega designed and launched the 32X add-on around the same time that their completely next-gen, full 32-bit console, the Saturn, would launch in Japan. Making matters much worse, Sega surprise-launched the console four months early in North America, only for Sony to immediately counter by announcing the PlayStation would be just... 299, 299, 299. So if you're confused trying to follow exactly what I'm talking about here, imagine how consumers felt at the time. What did I just buy? And what is this new thing? Sega in one stroke burnt the goodwill that they had fought so hard to claim from Nintendo and suddenly they were behind by a lot. Genesis A. As for the Saturn, it was a complete bust everywhere but Japan, which I guess is what happens when you go from, we're gonna make the best darn 2D system for true arcade to, oh my God, here comes Sony and they've got 3D. Now in hindsight, the Saturn has a pretty incredible library of hidden gems that I would highly recommend that you check out. But in the 90s, when 3D was the new hotness, developers just couldn't be arsed to learn its eccentric four chip architecture and Sega's penultimate effort would pave the way for the company's overall exit from the console hardware space. We're giving it a C for, come on, it at least deserved a chance. The Saturn is the most underrated system that Sega has ever made, maybe even by us. And I'm saying that knowing that most people would think that award goes to Sega's final effort, the Dreamcast. With a modem for network play built right in and a high quality VGA capable output, it was truly ahead of its time. And between great ports to the system, not to mention a slew of phenomenal new games, the Dreamcast would get off to the strongest start yet in video game history. That is, until a big old black DVD player, that we're gonna get to in a bit, don't worry, arrived holding its pink slip. Less than three years after its launch, Sega announced that not only was the Dreamcast headed out behind the barn, their entire console business was going with it. Sega, we salute you for your service, and we're giving the Dreamcast a strong B for being something that is still worth dusting off to this day. The good news is that in the same year that Sega admitted defeat, a new contender would pick up their torch. Microsoft was looking to make a little gaming machine of their own, and what's cool is you can still see some of that Sega DNA in the original Windows 2000 Lite machine. Six face buttons, a focus on network play, and even rumored Dreamcast compatibility, though that never came to fruition in spite of the fact that it used similar Windows CE and DirectX development tools. I mean, sure, the Xbox compared to the fully custom chips that the competition was using was 
basically a glorified Pentium 3 computer with a big controller. Like, what were they thinking big? But it was the most powerful system of its time, meaning that it often had the best version of multi-platform titles, not to mention a solid library of exclusives. This is before Microsoft settled into their safe spaces of Halo, Gears, and Forza, and they pushed weird character platformers and epic RPGs that competing machines just couldn't even hope to run. The Xbox was off to a rocking start. A tier. And that was just the beginning. Just four years later came the Xbox Two. Sorry, 360 with easily the best online service and games delivery of that generation, a modest entry price and developer-friendly hardware, the 360 was a no-nonsense gaming machine for gamers where pretty much any multi-platform title would arrive either first or better or both. Even franchises that had been Sony exclusive started uh, showing up on the Microsoft machine. I mean, sure. It doesn't have a huge list of its own exclusives, but there are some doozies in there, and Microsoft's big push in Japan gave the 360 the best Japanese library of any Xbox system. Can someone please remaster Lost Odyssey for crying out loud? Reliability issues aside, the 360 is Microsoft's finest and is an easy S for the countless nights of Halo 3 that kept millions from proper rest. Sadly though, Microsoft would pull a big dumb and try to make their next gen Xbox One the one device for everything. It had HDMI input for cable box pass through, mandatory connect integration for voice and motion controls, and worst of all, they angered gamers right out of the gate by simultaneously announcing an always online DRM scheme that in hindsight seems pretty similar to where we ended up, but I guess people weren't ready to hear it. This poor messaging, combined with underpowered hardware and a higher price, contributed to a major loss to the PS4, which had outsold it two to one by the end of 2017. And with Sony on solid footing again after their early PS3 stumbles, PlayStation exclusives started taking laps around Microsoft's struggling Xbox franchises. To Microsoft's credit, the Xbox team started dialing back the cable box connectness of the machine and did a much better job of supporting their Windows friends. But outside of Gears and Forza, it was kind of a wasteland. Microsoft clearly understood their advantage though in building cloud and data center services and followed up their successful Xbox Live subscription with Game Pass, an all-you-can-eat gaming subscription that frankly just smokes the competition for value. Unfortunately, this was too late in the cycle and they knew it. The one gets a C for, I wish I was playing as Master Chief, not Jameson Locke. Which brings us to the ninth generation Xbox or boxes. For the first time, we got two versions with wildly different performance characteristics. And for the second time, we got to focus on services rather than games. The series continue Microsoft's trend of cross-platform play and backwards compatibility, which is great, but also continue Microsoft's trend of especially the latter being kind of spotty. Microsoft has gone on an aggressive game studio gobbling spree, which theoretically should lead to some really exciting box mover titles, but we're kind of still waiting to see them, and apparently so are Microsoft's customers, with combined sales of the two Xbox series falling well behind the PS5. Now, it's still a bit early to give the Xbox series a definitive rank, but in spite of its poor sales, we're actually leaning towards a B for best darn gaming PC that you can buy for 300 or 500 bucks, or sometimes even less on sale. We'll have links below for the series and the other consoles that you can still buy. But before we rank the rest of those, I wanna go back in time to some things that you can't buy. In 1977, Nolan Bushnell started Chuck E. Cheese's. That franchise gets an F for its crappy pizza and its creepy rat. I promise I'm going somewhere with this. Five years earlier, he also co-founded Atari, maker of Pong, C, and the VCS, or as many now call it, the 2600. It was one of the most important machines for getting games into people's homes, even if the software feels painfully primitive now. We almost gave it an A for 
arguably most important console of all time, but we're going with a B for best not play this unless you have an academic interest. As for the 5200, it came five years later with barely any tech improvement and a non-existent game library, meaning that we've got our first F tier here, folks. Quiet you. As for the 7800, it gets a C, and that's thanks only to its backwards compatibility with the 2600. As for the Jaguar, hard to program for, expensive, and once again, no game library. That's another F, and that was the end of their console making days. Sorry Atari, I'll see you later. Now for some of Atari's competitors, like the Channel F. Is it for fun or is it for its ranking? It was the first proper home console with a real processor and ROM carts, but other than that, there's not much else to say about it. We're gonna go with a D. Magnavox Odyssey? That thing came out in 1972. Good Lord, that's five years before the 2600. For that alone, it gets a C. Most Odyssey 2 games have exclamation points in their titles, so D! Uh, the Intellivision, Mattel's only console, other than one built around scanning RFID cards. We're gonna give that one a C. And uh, the Connecticut Leather Company, yes, that is what Coleco stands for. ColecoVision was a technical juggernaut compared to its contemporaries, and uh, it gets a C as well. Enough of that though, let's jump forward a decade. The PC Engine slash TurboGrafx-16 was mostly ignored in the West, but in Japan, outsold the Mega Drive and had a robust library of games that make good use of the CD add-on. We're giving it a B. The Neo Geo was super cool. It literally brought an arcade machine's power into your house and all it cost you was nearly the same as an arcade machine. B anyway. As for the Philips CDI, that cost over $2,000 in today's money. It's yours, my friend, as long as you have enough rubies. F -f 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 -f. <laughs> As for the Amiga CD32, this one I don't know. It's possible it's amazing, but at these kinds of prices for working units, I'm just never going to know. Um, F for get f***ed collectors? Finally, rounding out our others list, we've got the 3DO, and it's gonna crawl into a D for having a few decent games and ports, even though it was a huge waste of money for both consumers and for its creators. Talk about PlayStation! All right, I was almost there anyway. PCFX D, there. The origin of the PlayStation is truly a wild tale of corporate backstabbery and poor business sense. Through its early years, Sony was a big player in electronics and music and had become one of Japan's biggest exporters. Their collaboration with Philips on the invention of the compact disc was revolutionizing the media world, but it would take Maverick engineer Ken Kutaragi to finally turn its R&D engine toward video gaming by forging a backroom deal to manufacture the Super Nintendo's sound chip. This sound chip led to a second, much more important deal with Nintendo. One for Sony to produce a CD-ROM version of the Super Famicom called the PlayStation. Now, as you may already know, that deal did not go as planned. And depending on who you ask, you'll get a very different answer to the question of who screwed over who. On the one hand, Sony was the bigger company and had been using its muscle to impose very unfavorable contract terms, including sole international rights to every game developed for the system and full control of licensing for every music and film deal. On the other hand, Nintendo had a history of tight and exclusive control over their consoles. They were worried about Sony using them as a stepping stone to a dominant position in video games. So they secretly sent emissaries to negotiate a more favorable arrangement elsewhere. One single day then, after Sony publicly announced their joint console at CES 1991, Nintendo slapped them in the face by abandoning both the contract and the years of co-development. They announced a partnership with Sony's collaborator on the CD format, Philips, and Sony was split on what to do next. Some of the old guard were looking for an excuse to retreat from the video game space anyway, while others favored just bending the knee to Nintendo and trying to salvage something from the original deal. There were even talks with Sega of America about developing a console together with them, but that idea was killed when the CEO of Sega apparently said, that's a stupid idea. Sony doesn't know how to make hardware. They don't know how to make software either. Why would we want to do this? <laughs> Hindsight really is a hell of a drug, folks. 
As for Kudaragi, I think we all know where he stood on this. He was still seeing red from his fresh embarrassment at CES and wanted to build it himself. Importantly, he had a key ally. The president of Sony partially obfuscated what he was doing from the Sony board by moving his team from headquarters to Sony Music Entertainment Japan. And while they worked, some key things happened. The success of Virtua Fighter confirmed that 3D graphics was the way forward, and the failure of the 3DO and the Jaguar proved that their console would either live or die by third-party support. So, a team from Sony's record label was sent to hundreds of studios to garner support. And their pitch? It was simple, but it was effective. They promised easy development and fair promotion of first-party and third-party games. Over 250 teams showed interest, and the rest is history. Just two days after their North American launch, Sony had outsold the Sega Saturn's entire five-month run. In the UK, it outsold Sega's console three to one, and by the end of their first year, Sony had taken a whopping 20% of the American video game market. They were selling so many games that they, co-inventor of the CD, needed to build new CD printing facilities to keep up with the outrageous demand. And even when Nintendo's fifth gen competitor showed up two years later, powered by superior 3D horsepower, not to mention iconic IPs, the PlayStation only picked up more steam. By the end of its life in 2006, the PlayStation had sold over 102 million units, more than double the sales of the N64 and the Saturn combined, and a huge part of that success is its enormous library of games. It's got more games than any console that came before, or any console that came since, reaching a final count of 7,918 titles. And it wasn't just quantity either. I mean, it's easy to find knocks against the PS1, like the atrocious loading times. But what you cannot argue with is the depth of its library. Not to mention its appeal to gamers who were, some of them, growing out of Nintendo's stubbornly family-friendly approach. It's an S tier for two reasons. One, because we didn't have a higher rank, and two, because if we ranked it anything else, I would first be murdered by my staff and then dragged through the street by the rest of you. Now. Sony knew the secret to the PS2's early success was going to be its great value. It offered backwards compatibility with the PS1, thanks to using its older brother's CPU as an I.O. controller, and, more importantly, it was one of the cheapest DVD players available. So, even though the PS2's library might have taken a few years to fill out due to its somewhat exotic architecture, there were strong reasons to buy it from day one, and buy it we did. The PS2 sales almost immediately choked out the Dreamcast and would come close to tripling the sales of Sega's machine, the GameCube, and the original Xbox combined. The PS2 is still the most sellingest game console of all time, though the Switch is nipping at its heels. And by the end of its decade plus of support, it had over 2,500 games to play with more in the GOAT conversation than probably any other machine. The PS2 is an easy S tier, and based on our rating system, is the number one console of all time. Oh, so that means it's downhill from here then, right? That's right! Here comes Sony's first speed bump. In their efforts to replicate the PS2's success by making it once again a Trojan horse for the latest optical media, and full-on backwards compatibility by stuffing a PS2 into it, not to mention the fact that they used a hard-to-develop-for supercomputer chip, the PS3's initial asking price ended up being a major friction point for consumers. Making matters worse, the launch title lineup was weak, and ports to the system were generally inferior to those on the Xbox 360. So for years, the PS3 looked like it was the clear loser of the seventh generation, a first for Sony. However, Eventually, Sony Studios would figure out how to maximize the performance of its unusual cell processor and would produce some impressive exclusives helping to undo at least some of that damage. Actually, a lot of it. I mean, if I was told that I could never play a video game again unless it was on a PS3, I would still have plenty to play, much of which is pretty goaded, but it can't be an S. Let's call it an A. 
Luckily though, Sony would learn from some of its mistakes and the PS4 would be a no-nonsense gaming first oasis in Microsoft's weird, always watching cable TV world. Sony Studios immediately got to work and there wasn't a year and maybe 2013 and 2019 that didn't have several games that made gamers sit up and go, shoot, I'm gonna need a PS4. Now, eventually we got a lot of those titles on PC, but if N64 is a B and PS3 is an A, PS4 has got to be an S. And this is especially highlighted by the perception, or maybe it's just us, that Sony's ninth gen white monolith feels more like a PS4 more proer. I mean, it's a more powerful, but still x86 gaming focused computer. It's got full compatibility with PS4 games, which is great. And we're only in year four with a pretty strong library of titles, but we can't help feeling a little desperate for some risk taking here instead of just more rehashing of the working formulas. I also don't love the direction they've taken their subscription services. Backwards compatibility not only is severely lacking, but it's locked behind reoccurring payments and cloud saves? Really, you guys? Who do you think you are? Nintendo? You wish. A tier. That is, unless something big changes. Like, if I stopped doing segues to sponsors. Squarespace, creating your own website doesn't have to be difficult. Luckily with Squarespace, it isn't. Their all-in-one platform makes it easy to get your website up and running quickly. Designing with their Fluid Engine Site Builder is easy. Also, start with a template and customize every detail imaginable with drag and drop technology for desktop or mobile. You can also use their asset library to manage all your files from one central hub and use them across the Squarespace platform. With Squarespace's analytic insights, you can see what's working well and what needs a little TLC. And if you need help, Squarespace has got your back with helpful guides and a 24-hour support team seven days a week. Head to squarespace.com forward slash LTT and get 10% off today. Now we know you guys are gonna have different opinions of the best consoles and games. So we wanna know what your favorites are in the comments. And if you like tier lists, hey, why don't you go check out the one where we ranked every generation of NVIDIA GPUs?